we know uh, digital technology has been amazing. We talk so much about it in this conference, about all the possibility that can potentially improve the betterment of healthcare. However, there are a lot of challenges we are also facing into how do we integrate from system to system? How do we really leverage policy changes to help us to implement these uh, amazing technology and innovation? And as well as how do we gain trust from the end users, our patients, as well as the healthcare system itself to actually wanting to implement, adapt. Uh, so thank you, April, for joining us. It's been amazing knowing you for the past year. And um, please introduce yourself. Thanks. So for those of you who didn't meet me yesterday at the conference, I'm April smith Rock. I am the Regional Health Administrator for the Department of Health and Human Services for New York. And I, I work for the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Thank you. That's a lot of amazing stuff you're doing from the back end of the healthcare, from a larger infrastructure organizational level. Uh, I'm Sabrina Rombach, a recovered clinician, been working for the past 15 years across 11 major healthcare systems. Um, and I got really burned out. And then realizing, you know what, there's some much more bigger things that we can do in the healthcare space than just seeing one patient operating, cutting <laughs> at the one time. And um, really, I uh, have moved now with my team be able to facing the growth healthcare uh, companies and entities to see what are they missing in their system? How do we get them into that bigger impact and profitability at the same time? And have run my podcast for the past three years, interviewed more than 150 experts on the show. What we learned is that there's a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things that we're doing. But the barrier has been that as well. So what do you think are some of the bottlenecks for our organizations to be able to quickly implement and scale with all the amazing possibilities coming out of the pipeline? Well, I've been working for the last probably four years really doing environmental scanning, talking to founders, talking to funders, talking to people with great ideas, academics, really trying to understand where is the field? Where are we going? What are the possibilities? Where are the things that we're missing out on? What are the things that we can do that we can't do? And um, there are a lot of bottlenecks. I think we're in a time period, especially as it pertains to digital health, of rapid proliferation. And, and I think that eventually what we will see is consolidation and adoption. But as long as we have so many new technologies, new solutions, new tools coming into the practice of medicine and healthcare and prevention and public health, we're going to see this time period of a lot of confusion and bottleneck because there's just so much coming in. It's the proverbial drinking from the fire hose. Exactly, going off that point as from a clinician perspective, if you're gonna ask me to use 10 different software to track my patient to get information, it's gonna be very overwhelming. We already don't have enough time. And then I'm lucky if I spend that much time to even just go into in depth of why we do something and how we're carrying out. So it's definitely there's a level of how do you integrate all the system into every single possible EHR. We know some hospital system, the outpatient is very different from inpatient side. So you end up learning all different technologies and trying to just click through things just to get to the point of yeah. what we need to do. I think sometimes, especially in public health and, and more traditional, you know, really well-established practices in medicine, we get to this point where we lack the imagination to understand how we might use the new tools, and they become incredibly overwhelming. Uh, so, you know, I was around when we were implementing EMRs. Many of you were around when we were implementing EMRs, and it was, you know, tooth and nail. Nobody wanted to implement them. Nobody wanted to use them. And everyone still hates them, frankly. I, I have very rarely talked to a physician who said, I love my EMR, you know. They're, they're causing extra time, extra work. It's a lot of heavy billing and audit. Um, and, and what we're seeing, I think, is a lot of the innovation that's happening with APIs and plugins and things for our EMRs are intended to reduce some of that burden. And so 
there will probably be winners and losers. The hope on the federal government side, because we're always concerned about, you know, uh, the the best possible outcomes for all patients. It's equity. It's access. It's um, it's designing these new tools in a way that benefits patients and uh, the general population and is accessible to all of them. And, and that really is a challenge when you're looking at some of these technologies that are coming at doctors. Yes, there's great technologies. Yes, there are amazing things that can help keep our patients healthy, that can help intervene at earlier stages in disease, that can catch you know, all sorts of symptomology with radiology. There's, there's all sorts of... Um, AI uh, driven benefits that can be applied even just within that single field. Um, and the challenge is how do we stop the overwhelm and identify what's really going to be helpful and, and really figure out how to leverage that in, in the practice of medicine and in the practice of public health. Right, and I believe our earlier speaker uh, was mentioning that what's the mentality do you simply finding something you agree to it you see the value and you act and apologize later because we can't trust ourselves that we can't always be a problem solver um, no matter what if we inact if we have to trust ourselves build out the confidence to take action then sometimes you already pass the golden market right? right this golden hour of what we can do and that opportunity could be fleeting versus we can think Everything is an opportunity. Everything is a learning lesson. How can we take upon the best that we can be and moving forward with that? Which will also lead me into the next thing is with all the puzzle pieces, there's a lot of them. How do we really improve the infrastructure of our healthcare system? And then how do we really integrate it so we have the best resources and to be able to adapt these things much more effectively? Well, at a federal level, I have to say the pandemic really forced us into a more rapid adoption of emerging technologies than we had been on the path to do previously. Uh, I think we would have gotten there eventually, but it definitely accelerated things like telehealth and, and uh, you know, remote monitoring and things like that. So um, the regulatory environment and the reimbursement environment, it takes a little while to catch up. And, and, you know, maybe for some physicians, this is actually a good thing because not everybody wants to be an early adopter. And like I said, the proverbial drinking from the fire hose, it will give a little bit of time for things to settle and to make it more apparent what it is that you should invest your time and energy and maybe shouldn't. Um, but we are we're working really rapidly to promulgate new regulations, new guidance. FDA is promulgating guidance on real world evidence and all sorts of things that are going to bring our health system forward. So we're, we're really kind of focusing on a responsible and thoughtful and very methodical updating of the way that the federal regulations and guidance are, are persuading us to practice medicine so that, that there's a, a better interaction that allows for innovation, that allows for the field of medicine and health to move forward without um, you know, putting patients and doctors at risk. Exactly. I think we all work really hard for our medical license, and then we wanted to be there to do good. And yet, at the same time, we wanted to see what could be more. And so having conversations with um, colleagues has been, let's just use remote monitoring, for example. What's the chance of our patient actually using it? Uh, and uh, when you have some of the conversation with them, even though we wanted to be more proactive, preventative side, this is really a free resource because the government help you, like Medicare and Medicaid covers for it. But in their head, for some reason, there's a distrust. There's a thing of, I'm doing well. I know what to eat. I know what to do. Why are you tracking me? Um, do I really need it? Oh, I'm only on a blood pressure medication, only cholesterol. Do I really need to do anything at that? So in terms of that, with um, expressing and expanding all accessibility with some of the areas in that perhaps patients do have a difficulty to see their doctors as we have earlier presentation on telemedicine, integration. Um, how do you see fit into educating the public as well as the provider side to help bridging the digital divide? I mean, I think that we need to be very thoughtful and innovative within innovation to really understand that there are cultural differences. For instance, I do a lot of work with Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico, they want to have face-to-face -face interactions, right? But 
Yeah, there are shortages of specialty physicians, and there are other ways that you can use a tool like telehealth that still provides a face-to-face -face interaction that perhaps creates a care team where you might have a primary care physician working via telehealth with the patient in the room with the primary care and the, the specialty physician doing a consult at the same time. That might be a way that you could incorporate new technology while respecting the cultural values and providing the type of care that, that a, a patient would want and need to have and feel more engaged with. And there, there are ways that we can design the emerging technologies to foster that trust. You know, I, I spoke with uh, an organization that was looking even at the usage of colors in, uh, in different applications. And they realized that in the Sikh community, a white background was portending doom. It, it, was, it was not a, a positive feeling that a white background would give in an application or on a website. And they helped an organization to design a, a website or application that was just beige, light beige. But it, it changed the way that that cultural group was able to engage with products and with medical um, services. So really understanding how we have the ability now to tailor some things to really be more inclusive, to be more culturally appropriate, and to provide services that are, are more tailored to people will help to bring that inclusion and, and accessibility in. And we just need to work on the cost piece. Oh, yes. Uh, and I think that your point about just that visual cue, right, make that be easier to adapt because we all know the best way we learn actually is by watching. And then the different level of memory based on neuroscience is about watching, listening, then adding on to the doing side. So that's a conversation I often have with my uh, leaders and to show them that sometimes we have to be very in sync in how we are speaking yeah. to everybody else because there are three natural languages, the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical. If you're so in tune as speaking that physical language of deadlines, goals, orientations, sometimes that can be very overwhelming for all the spiritual people who are really about the big picture, right? Feel good. And how do you purposely driven motivate people versus the emotional uh, storyteller? They're the best connectors. So if we can incorporate different type of languages while we're having these conversations from both the physician side and, and mystery, administration side as well as patient side, we can really be more in tuned into not just what we say, but how we say to bring people on board. Right, there's, you know, there's emerging technology that does not rely on patient interaction, like the way that uh, mammography has advanced to use AI algorithms to detect tumors, right? So that you don't need to be culturally aware to use. You just need to be able to read a film with more accuracy than human eyes can do. And we can program computers to do that. Uh, but when, when it starts to get to the place where you're interfacing with patients, you know, the, the physician is not going away, the doctor is not going away, and they will always have that role in that, that communication and understanding of what is and is not appropriate for their patient. And what should be happening is that these tools should be able to be integrated so that they're, it's, it's not necessarily, oh, I want the newest, flashiest tech. It's that I now have all of these tools in my tool pack so that I can then use the correct ones with each of my patients. Right, and I think from the clinician side, it would be great if I have just a big chart all categorized and then show me all the pros and cons, right? And then that could be taking some time for that one person with the insider knowledge to be able to ask the right question to composite something like that together. And as new technology coming up to play that needed to continues to be upgraded. But there's a lot of uh, conversation even from the uh, larger organization side of how do you create what I call that win-win situation. So when you're coming into a technology company, going into an organization, technically you're getting all these patient data, be able to improve what it is going forward. However, um, the clinician side, the organization is not just using the tool, right? How do you really come together for a common goal? I think that's very important. And that could be something difficult for um, people to sort out what is that true one one can be. Yeah. Uh, great. 
And then as we're moving forward, um, how do you think the advancements in digital technology, and especially when it comes to um, uh, allocating the right resources, um, be able to help us to move forward? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is trying to understand where technology incorporation is appropriate and is not appropriate in medical practice and what are the limits of our current tech, but also to have the imagination of where it might go. So we don't want to limit ourselves to what exists today if we know that something else that might replace that is better and coming down the pike. So it requires like a, a really great deal of mental flexibility, which I'm not even practicing medicine and I find that overwhelming to think that not only could you incorporate a tool today, but that tool might be replaced with something else tomorrow. And then you still have your patients coming in and saying, can you look at my Apple Watch data? <laughs> it must be incredibly overwhelming. So I think part of it is, is training, it's mindset, it's, it's learning how not to be overwhelmed in the fact that we are living in a very rapidly evolving time in what promises to be a very rapidly evolving practice of medicine. And um, allocating resources is, can be a really, really difficult thing because it's hard to know what, what to invest in. I do think you know, many of these new technologies will settle over the next 10, 15 years, and we will really kind of understand exactly where the best applications are and how to best use them and how to get them to patients. And right now, you know, my real concern is understanding the the foundation of all of these applications they're all being built on what we what is very much still a flawed and biased system so um, the allocation resources for me it's really really important to make sure that all of these tools that are coming forward are accounting for and wherever possible eliminating that bias eliminating those inequities so that we can build forward to be more equitable Exactly. And thank you so much for all your insights. And um, thanks, everyone, for being here.